Hi, this is the fourth mini lecture video for this week and this is about permutations and combinations. So permutations and combinations tell us how many ways there are of doing something with a given number of objects or items or things. And it's helpful to us because we're talking about probabilities and we've said that the probability of an event A is equal to the number of outcomes in A divided by the total number of outcomes in the sample space. So uh, permutations and combinations help us to work out what these numbers are. And we do that by systematically counting the number of points A of which an event A consists. And K is the number of points of the sample space. So if we can systematically work out what those are, we've got a way of finding the probability of things happening. So for example, if you have 10 different screws in a bag and you pull out uh, one screw at a time randomly and then line them up, how many different ways are there of pulling out those screws? Well, we'll find that with 10 different screws, pulling them out in any one particular order, there are 3,628,800 ways of doing it. And so if you wanted to achieve one of those particular orders, then your probability of getting that randomly is 1 in 3,628,800. Not much chance. Um, but that's a big number. So how can we work out what these are? They're too big to count out individually. So let's have a look. Let's take a case of three letters A, B, C. There are 3 times 2 times 1, that's three factorial permutations for how we can order that. So ordering all three of them, A, B, C, A, C, B, B, A, C, and so on, we'll see there are six ways of doing it, 3 times 2 times 1. And we see the order matters. So for a permutation, the order matters. A, B, C is different from A, C, B, because they're in a different order. So generalizing that, if we have n different things and we're taking all of them, there are n factorial different ways that we can take them when order is included. And so in this case, there were three things, so it was three factorial ways of organizing them. But sometimes you might have n things, but they are not all different. They can be divided into classes of alike things. So we're saying that there are C classes of alike things um, amongst the N things in total. And in that case, the number of ways that they can be arranged is N factorial, where N is the total number of things, divided by the number of things in class one and the number of things in class two, each of those factorial, multiplied together for however many classes you've got. So for example, if you have a box with six red and four blue balls in it, What's the probability of pulling the balls out randomly in this particular order? All the red ones first and then all the blue ones after. We can work that out now because we know that there are 6 plus 4 is 10 balls in total, so n is equal to 10. And there are two classes, red and blue, and there's 6 in one class and 4 in the other. So we can work out how many different ways there are of pulling those balls out of the box. There are 10 factorial divided by 6 factorial times 4 factorial, and that's 210 ways of doing it. And how many ways are we interested in? Well, we're interested in just one particular way that it can be done. So the probability of putting, withdrawing the balls in that order is 1 in 210. Here's another example. Six different things, and we've taken them all. And so that's one particular order that they could be arranged in. But it's uh, n factorial, which is 6 factorial, equals 720 different ways that these six balls could be arranged. But now they're not emoji golf balls, they're just coloured golf balls. So we've still got six balls, but there are four yellow, one red and one blue. So how many different ways can they be arranged now? Well, now it's different because these two could be switched around, but it would be the same sequence. They're still both yellow. So that's why it's different. So now we have n factorial still, but now it's divided by the number of each class factorial. 
So we have four factorial, one factorial, one factorial, and then that comes to 30. So there's fewer ways that these can be arranged and that makes sense because there's less variation between them. In these examples, we've been taking all of them and looking at how many ways there are to arrange all of the different things. So we've been arranging six different things in all the ways that they can be. But you don't have to take all of them out. In this case, we're taking k at a time from n things. <coughs> Two permutations consisting of the same k elements, but in a different order, are different because order matters with permutations. So for example, there are six different permutations of the three letters A, B and C taken two at a time. So we've got A, B and C, but we're just taking two at a time and there are six different ways we can do that. A, B, A, C, B, C, B, A, C, A and C, B. So in this is a case we have without repetition. We're just taking two, but we can't take the same ones twice. So without repetition, this equation, n factorial divided by n minus k factorial, where k is the number that we're taking, n is the total number of things, that tells us how many different permutations there are in that arrangement. So here, for example, we've got six different things, and we're going to take three at a time, randomly. So in that case, it's six factorial divided by six minus three factorial is 120. There are 120 different ways of taking three of these when we're considering order as well. So now we're going to look at what happens when repetition is included. So a permutation of n things taken k at a time with repetitions is an arrangement obtained by putting any given thing in the first position, any given thing, including a repetition of the one just used in the second position, and so on. So before we weren't using the same letter twice, but if we were, we would add three extra combinations when we have two letters out of the A, B, and C out of the three, because now we could have A, A, B, B, and C, C. So the number of different permutations of n things taken k at a time with repetition is equal n to the power k. So for example, if you have a coded telegram, the letters are arranged in groups of five, how many different groups of five letters are there? Well, there are 26 letters in the alphabet, that's how many we can be selecting from, and we're taking five of them. And we can repeat those letters. Once we've taken a letter from the alphabet, we can still take it again and use it again. And in that case, there are 11,881,376 different ways of arranging those five letters. Then if we impose a rule on it, how many groups of five letters are there which each contain no letter more than one? So now there's no repetition. You can only use one letter once in that. So now we have the uh, equation from before for that. So now it's 26 factorial divided by 26 minus 5 factorial and that comes to 7,893,600. So permutation with repetition, <coughs> taking any three of those, but now we can duplicate if we want to. We can have repetition of the same element. So here we would have six to the power three, 216 different ways of taking these. So that increases the number of possible permutations than what we had before without repetition. Now we move on to combinations. So I've been emphasizing how in a permutation the order of the selected things is essential and it makes one permutation different from another even if they have the same elements in them but if they're in a different order that's a different permutation. A combination is the case where we don't mind what order they're in it's just about what the things are irregardless of the order that they're withdrawn in or what they're arranged in. Again, there are two types of combination where you have repetition and without repetition. So without repetition, the number of ways of taking k items from n in total is n factorial divided by k factorial multiplied by n minus k factorial. And that's written like this, nk, which is the uh, binomial coefficient. 
if you have repetition, we can still express it using the binomial coefficient, but now we write it like this. It's n plus k minus 1 uh, on top of k, uh, and so that comes to n plus k minus 1 factorial divided by k factorial n minus 1 factorial. So again, we can easily work out how many different combinations there are of doing something with uh, um, a combination. Order doesn't matter, but repetition, whether or not we have that, it does matter. So for example, we are taking five pipe fittings that can be selected from a lot of 500 pipe fittings. How many ways are there to do that? Well, if you're just taking one out of a box of 500, uh, you can't have repetition. And once you've taken it out, it's not there anymore. So you can't repeat it. So in that case, you'd have 500 divided by 5 factorial multiplied by 500 minus 5 factorial. And that would come to a uh, massive 255 and a bit more billion combinations. So here's a combination without repetition. We have six golf balls. We're taking three at a time. It doesn't matter which order we've taken them in. <clears throat> Without repetition, the number of possible ways you could take three is six factorial divided by three factorial. Six minus three factorial is equal to 20. But with repetition, you can take them and then you can take the same one again. So now there are more ways of doing that. Six plus three minus one factorial divided by three factorial, six minus one factorial is 56. So there are 56 ways of doing it like that. This is the last point where we have sampling without replacement. So sampling with replacement guarantees independence of trials and it leads to the binomial distribution. So that means we're taking something out of uh, a box or out of the population it's come from and we're not replacing it. So once we've taken one item as part of our sample, uh, we can't take it again and um, the population has changed. So if we sample with replacement, then each time you take the sample, it's the same process because the population hasn't changed. If you are um, not replacing the sample, each time you take a sample out, then the population has changed, so that's different. So with replacement, uh, that is independent trials and that leads to the binomial distribution. But if we have it without replacement, we have to consider it differently. So in a box containing n different things, say for example m of them are defective, the probability of drawing a defective one is m divided by n, and thus the probability of drawing a non-defective is 1 minus m divided by n. And so the probability of drawing x defectives in n trials is this. This is the binomial coefficient, n in x trials, sorry, x, uh, x defectives drawn in n trials, and that's the probability of getting a defective. And so that's the binomial distribution that we're going to look at again uh, next week, probably. Um, but without replacement, it means that we don't return the item back. The trials are no longer independent, and the result of one draw will affect the probabilities of future draws. And so now we can write the probability of drawing x defectives and n trials like this, uh, where this is the uh, binomial coefficient written in uh, those three different ways. And so you'd have to expand all of those binomial coefficients to work out what that probability is. OK, this is a summary now of what we've just seen. We're looking at n different things. When you have n different things, you can either take all of them uh, or you can take k at a time. And each time you do that, you can either do it uh, without repetition or with repetition. So we've broken it down into four different categories. Then if you do that as a permutation where order matters, this is the total number of ways of doing it n factorial, where you're taking all of them without repetition. If you have repetition and you're taking all of them, well, there's an infinite way of doing that because you're taking one, uh, you're replacing it, you can take it again, you can just keep on taking, taking, taking. So there's an infinite different ways that you could take all of those. Uh, taking k at a time without repetition, we've got the n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. And with repetition, we've got n to the k. Then for the case of the combination, 
if you're taking all of them without repetition, then there's only one way of doing it because once you've taken all of them, you've got all of them. It doesn't matter what order you took them in, there's just that one way of doing it. If you're taking k at a time without repetition, we've got this term, n factorial over k factorial, n minus k factorial, and with repetition we've got this one that we saw earlier. So we can see there a matrix of the different situations that we're dealing with. Uh, of course there are other possible ways of doing things which complicate life further, um, but this is a, a nice generic um, uh, summary of the main things that happen. And remember the reason we're doing this is because we're interested in finding the probabilities of things happening so that we can work out, ultimately work out engineering decisions um, given uh, the choices that we have and the information that we have. And doing this will enable us to work out the number of possible um, things that could happen and then we can work out the probability um, of what we want to happen or don't want to happen happening. Okay, the other type of problem we looked at was where we had C classes of equal things within N things. Again, we looked at, uh, in this case, we only looked at where we're taking all of them without repetition, with repetition, we had these results. For permutation, we had this result. And then for combination, uh, it's just one way of taking all of them, or there's an infinite way of taking them if you keep on replacing them, you do that forever. Okay, thank you. So that's a brief summary of combinations and permutations. The next lecture we're going to move on to uh, probability distributions and this will then start to tie this discussion back to the initial histograms that we were looking at in the first lectures uh, where we are generating experimental data and trying to find um, distributions that represent that data and now we're going to find in our next lectures probability distributions for known types of problem and then we'll see how these can uh, be linked up together. Thank you for listening.